Hi folks, um, today we have a special guest, a special lady, a dynamic lady who wears several hats and has several strings to her bow in many disciplines. So let's go over to start our first questions in regards to what she does, her life or history and so on. And I'm sure we will know a bit more at the end of this program who Miss Myrna Loy, also known as DJ Lady Loy or Empress Lady Loy. As an artist, um, can you tell us more about how you got started and becoming an artist? Well, I think my painting started when I, um, I used to use it as therapy. So it, uh, I'm not quite, I did A level art at school. Um, I, not because I was interested in art, but as, a, as an option for one of the sciences. So one of the sciences. But so I, I kind of liked art, but I only decided to dabble in it when I, when I felt depressed or when I felt upset. And it was very therapeutic, you know, I used oils and just trying to create. I never had an image in my head. I didn't know what I was going to paint. Whatever was in my mind, and it usually used to be for faces only, I would create from that. And then when the outcome came, I kind of felt a lot of relief. We know like several businesses that you've more or less run. What is your concept in running a business? Or what can we take away from us? Any advice you've got to give us in regards to a business, running a business? Resources, people to support. That was my biggest obstacle. Um, it's a kind when you're setting up a business, it's a kind of a lonely project if you're doing it by yourself. And so that was my biggest. I had all the enthusiasm, all the all the passion. I had financial resources. I had a play, you know, the place to do everything. But what I didn't have is human support, and that was my biggest um, obstacle. Okay, I understand. Okay, um, as a writer, um, you've done several books and stuff. Would you want to name the books and what influenced you to becoming a writer and writing these books? Um, once again, it's all life experiences. All my creative endeavours are therapeutic. Um, they all get me through a passage of time. Um, my poetry, I started writing poetry when I was 15, when I was locked away in a room by myself and I didn't know how to express myself I didn't have anyone to talk to so I used to start writing and as I wrote I found that my um, the lines rhymed automatically and then I just used to absorbing the energy swaying in the breeze leaves the suckling living off the branches as we live off foundation of our history. It's a mystery how tainted by life's adversities, the storms, the hail, the snow, yet still they grow even more resilient. We can learn from the trees who feed off the breeze and the oxygen we breathe that give us life. They stand tall, knowing that the rainfall will quench their thirst and that a sunburst will satisfy their needs. You stay keep, away. Just keep coming out, coming out, rhyme after rhyme after rhyme. And then I realised I was a natural poet and I think out of all my skills, I think poetry is the one I gravitate towards the most, even though I don't use it often. But it's a natural thing for me. Okay, can you tell us more about how your first book, how what your writing experience was like? Yeah, I've written about seven books. Um, the first one was The Other Side of Tourism, which is about my experience in, as an Englishwoman, um, visiting Jamaica, thinking that I was Jamaican, and having that conflict of culture, and realising that I was more English than I was Jamaican, and my intolerance for, you know, the lackadaisical behavior that was there at the time. It's improved now for tourists, but I just found that 
I thought I was more tolerant, but I found that I, had, I lacked tolerant when I was there. So it was that uh, it was struggling to reconcile the two cultures, and so that was what um, the other side of tourism was about. Um, I also um, did the other side of tourism. Poetry's promise is my life is my life in poetry. Poetry's teacher is all the experiences I've had in poetry. Um, Spirit of Queens. I feel that was divinely inspired because it just came to me one after the other. Um, poetry's, po poetry's promise meets poetry's teacher is a tribute to my granddaughter who committed suicide. And um, Lover's Rock, More Than a Dance Floor, in part one and two, is basically about that era that I grew up in and how um, relationships were formed on the dance floor. It wasn't just a dance floor us listening to music. It was a place to be nurtured, a place to find love, a place to feel accepted. And it was a safe place. And so, yeah, so each one of my books are based on my experiences. Okay, would you say Lover's Rock, uh, the book that you wrote, mm. uh, is more than a dance? Would you say that sort of slingshotted you into becoming a DJ? No, because I DJ before I was a writer, uh, before I wrote the book. Okay, so you being a DJ, most people know you as a DJ. Mm. You know what started you off and becoming a DJ for someone who writes books, someone who's a businesswoman, someone who is an artist. Mm. What kind of propelled you into that direction? I think more it was um, opportunities. The opportunity I saw, I saw in a newspaper that they would train people to be a DJ. And this was when I was living in London, and I just took the opportunity to be trained as a DJ. And it was so we're going to have a revival segment for the second hour. You've just logged in, you've logged into Lady Loy, broadcasting out of the east of England, around the globe on Lovers Rock Radio, every Friday, 7 till 9. Is from Latin America. Coming up next is Kendra, her track, The Two of Us. How do you like the track original, Sharon Mango? No, it's right. Once again, big up all the people in the chat room, big up all the silent listeners. Also, as a presenter, as well, because you're not just a DJ, you also present Black White Radio Show. What mm. started that? That was organic. I didn't, that's nothing planned. I've never considered myself a presenter. Um, I find that I like to interpret, I like to um, understand what people are saying. And in understanding what people are saying, and maybe somebody else doesn't understand it. I try to express it from my perspective and I like to think of myself more as a teacher when I'm playing, doing a DJ as opposed to just doing a DJ and I think that's how the presenter part comes out because some people listen to the songs, they don't listen to the lyrics and so sometimes I feel that the artist has written the lyrics for a reason, maybe based on his experiences like me as an artist and that a lot of times um, it's important that that message is told to the people who are listening. And sometimes when I do explain it, they're like, wow, they never thought of that or they never looked at it that way. And it makes them listen to the music in a different way. Yeah, but also you do interviews and so on as a presenter. Mm. Um, as a DJ, a woman DJ as well, mm. what sort of challenges do you face? in that arena? I don't really face any challenges. The only challenges I do face that concern me is equipment failure. Or, because for example, I was meant to interview Pam Hall and there was such a big hype behind it. And on the day, um, my my phone gave, gave out or whatever happened to it, but I missed that interview. 
that kind of thing makes me feel very um, feel as that it affects my reputation and I felt really upset that I had created this hype and she had created a hype and it didn't take place and it affected me for weeks maybe months after that but it's really with interviews it's only is the equipment going to work is something in that in what it's not what I'm going to say or whether or not and sometimes it is whether that person will be there or whether that person is going to call in and I try to control that by calling them but it's more to do with will the equipment take will the equipment let me down or will it not oh. and have I you know taken everything into consideration have I planned properly okay that's one of the things about you lady like which really you know I'm sure my audience back home are wondering the same thing how do you do this to me it's just one it's I don't see it as separate entities a lot of people say you know you're doing this and that you must be so busy but I see it as one whether I'm um, on TikTok whether I'm on Facebook I see it as one just serving people giving people advice raising awareness um, just really what was America like for you how did you see it was it you know what should I say vastly different from from England I was allowed to be totally myself. I didn't feel judged. I didn't feel as though I had to dress a certain way. I didn't feel as though anybody was telling me what to do. I was, you know, for the first time in my life, I was able to be who Myrna Loy was. And I remember painting again when I was in America. I painted when I was in England and then I stopped. And I painted again when I was in America. And so I felt as though I was truly at my best. That was my pinnacle in America. What was your time at the UN like? What was that like? Okay. And I lived in Angola for a year. Okay. So when I lived in Angola for a year, once again, it gave me another insight to who I was. I used to think I was just a secretary or just this. I didn't have much self-esteem. But when I went to live in Angola, I was given multiple responsibilities. I was in charge of the Board of Inquiry. I had to go in a helicopter and interview um, people in Angola who had kidnapped civilians and stuff like that. And I was the head of the personnel department. So once again, um, it gave me an insight to who I was and it kind of made me feel more important. And then that was that was separate from the UN because when you go on mission, I did work for the UN for twelve years, but when you go on mission, you're not you're not really a UN person. You then become a an assignee, a mission assignee, as opposed to an employer or an employee in the UN. So working in the UN, that was just like a nine to five job, like when I'm here. I didn't know. I didn't know what the UN was. I found it out by default. I was just looking for a job. So working for the UN, for me it was just a nine to five. It was the other people that said, my goodness, you work for the UN. And I'm like, why are they behaving like that? Because I didn't realize it was a, a place of repute at the time. So yeah, I was really privileged and I was really blessed to get that job because um, I was thinking that if I didn't get a job in America I'd have to come back to England which was not an option at the time so I prayed and I prayed and I said to God if I meant to go back to England I'll go back but if I meant to stay in America please give me a job a stable job and I was working at a firm of solicitors and this person said to me look you know you don't have to go back if you've got time on your visa I had two weeks on my visa left you could get a job with the UN as long as your passport is valid. And so I went and the day I went, they'd lifted the, um, the stop on recruitment on that day. And I was able to interview for a job and I got the job the same day. So that kind of meant that I had a job. It meant that I could be relaxed and relieved and feel safe. 
and then it led me to meeting my family and so it all spiraled from there. Yo, what's your like social life? Because I understand you're a biblical translator on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, social media platforms. Yeah, how did you become involved and in becoming a Bible translator? Yeah, um, I call myself the Biblical Translator, not because I translate the Bible, but it's because I interpret the Bible in a language that makes sense to me, and therefore I feel it might make sense to other people. Once again, it's still the same thing, trying to make things easier for people. So when I used to read the Bible, I found it so complex and difficult to understand. The more I read it, the more I am the biblical translator in quotes, the more I find it easier to understand. The more when I share my, that understanding with other people, I'm pleased when they say, oh, thank you, I did, didn't look at it that way. Um, what Bible do you read? And, you know, they, they, it just um, makes me feel as though I'm serving a purpose. So when I do the biblical translator, I have to pray first, of course, I have to pray for understanding because when you look at the Bible, sometimes it looks double Dutch. And like today, the normal Bible I, I read, I left it at work. So I had to go to the King James Bible and it's very complex, but I read a, a different Bible even before I read that one which kind of made it simpler. And then I read the King's James. And so I could get an understanding from the different texts so that when I'm speaking out, how does it relate to somebody today? Mm. And I think that is what it is. I don't want the Bible to be something historic and has no relevance to people today. So I try to bring it in the present. And that's how that came about. Okay. Well, uh, juggling all these several different hats that you wear, how do you find time for social life? Well, my social life has kind of dwindled now, but I think that's more because I don't really have an interest as such as I did before. And I think as you evolved and you get more interested in things, my social, to me, that is my social life. Um, when I'm doing TikTok or when I'm on Facebook or whatever, to me that's my social life. Sometimes I feel when I go to work, that's also my social life. I don't look at work and um, what I do at home as is work and work. I look at it as work, rest and play. So I have time to rejuvenate. I have time to give to other people like with my employer I'm working to a strict regime. When I come home, I might be working, but I'm working to my own schedule. I'm not under the whip. I'm not being told what to do or how to do it. So there's that kind of a balance. So, yeah, I kind of, I don't know if that answered the question. Hey, who are your influences? I'd have to say my mother um, influenced me quite a lot, even though I rebelled against her just as much as she tried to influence me and God is my influence because he never fails and he cannot disappoint so those are my most influential I don't have like what people would say oh singers or actors or anyone like that I can't think of anybody who influenced me even though I can talk about people who I liked like Tina Turner I loved her vivaciousness I love the, the fact that she didn't conform. Same like Sure, I love the, the people that are off the beaten track, that don't follow the rules, that are individuals. So I admire people like that. So Sure would be one, and Tina Turner would be another. Okay. What are your views on the Windrush? I think it's really sad about the history of Windrush because when you think a lot of our parents and grandparents came to the UK believing that they could start a life here when the government had in their minds that they only wanted to use them for a period of time and then send them back 
But they didn't let the Windrushians know, the Windrush generations know that their stay here was meant to be temporary. And so they brought all their children over and they started building homes here, believing that they belonged here. Only to find in 2012, when the hostile environment policy came out, that they had to go back if they weren't properly documented. And a lot of people, because they came to the UK, they came visa free, they came, children came on their parents' passport, they had no documentation. So they didn't have the documentation required and as a result they were wrongly deported. And I think that's the saddest thing about the Windrush generation, that they did not reap everything that they sowed. Okay folks, ladies and gentlemen back home, as you can see, we've just conducted an interview with Miss Lady Loy and she had such a vast experience in different hats that she's worn wearing or will be wearing because there's no stopping to her so um we would just like to thank her for coming in and we look forward to seeing her again and thank you at home for watching thank you